Today we're going to talk about some really interesting, unusual infectious agents that don't fit in the uh, classification of all the other viruses that we talk about. And these really address an interesting question, which is, what's the smallest genome size you would need to be infectious? And do you need any genome at all to be infectious? And the agents we're going to talk about today, they're called viroid satellites and prions. They uh, address these questions. So start first with viroids. These are agents, infectious agents, that consist only of RNA. They don't encode any protein, okay? Um, they have no coat. There's just a naked RNA molecule that's floating around out there. Uh, they can go from host to host. They don't need receptors to get into the host. And um, this is how many sequences we know of at the time, 1,742. And there's actually a website that keeps track of all of these. So that's viroids. So they're typically small, single-stranded RNA circles. As I said, they have no codes. They don't encode any protein. There's no protein coding region at all. When you put these in plants, they replicate. So these are largely plant uh, infectious agents. And there are two families. They're called pospiviroidae. And these replicate in the nucleus of the plant cell. And the other is avsunviroidae. They replicate in chloroplasts of the plant cells. And the first one discovered was called potato spindle tuber viroid. These all have really neat names based on the disease. So the, na the name is abbreviated PSTV, little d, big V, little d is viroid, discovered 1967. That was the first one discovered. So it's the prototype. It's only 359 nucleotides long. And some of these viroids cause disease in plants. You can see here, these are tomato plants inoculated with uh, different viroid strains. And after inoculate, they're inoculated at the seed or the early level, and then they're allowed to grow for the same amount of time. You can see uh, some of these viroids cause stunting of the plant. They don't grow. So this is economically important, obviously. Some viroids have no effect whatsoever, and we don't worry about those. But they probably have some role in the ecosystem, of course. These are some of my favorite names. Kadang, kadang, coconut viroid causes a disease of coconut palms, makes the leaves yellow, and affects the fruit growth. Uh, hop latent viroid. This is an example of one that doesn't cause any disease. This infects hops, which you use to make beer, right? But this doesn't cause any problems. And then apple scar skin viroid. It makes the apple look funny. I don't know if you've ever been to a market, you might see apples like that. Um, it's caused by a viroid. Doesn't affect the taste but people might not pick it up because it looks funny. But if they're cheap, you might pick them up, right? Anyway, I like those, those are pretty neat. Just an example of some of them. So again, they don't encode proteins, they don't encode mRNA, they're just an RNA molecule. Again, they're circular. They range in size from 120 to 475 nucleotides. The RNA is extensively base paired, as I'll show you uh, in a moment, and some of these uh, viroids encode what we call a ribozyme. I shouldn't say encode because encode suggests protein. A ribozyme is an RNA enzyme. It's an RNA sequence that can cleave itself. All right? It's a relic of the RNA world when there weren't proteins and RNAs had a lot of the activity. So these are different from viruses. Right? Viruses are parasites of the translational machinery. They need to make mRNAs that can be translated because they don't have a translational system. Uh, depending on the size, of course, some viruses have nucleic acid enzymes, some don't. But they're all parasites of the translation machinery, whereas viroids, you can imagine as tr parasites of the transcription machinery, the machinery of the host cell that takes DNA, makes RNA from it. As you'll see in a moment, those are the enzymes that copy uh, these viroids. So here are two different viroids. On top is our potato spindle tuber viroid. It's the pospiviroidae family. These replicate in the nucleus. You can see the RNA is extensively base, base paired. So it looks like a double-stranded RNA and it has a, a number of bulges in it. And these have regions that are conserved. 
with regions that are involved in pathogenesis, variable regions as well. So people have altered these by mutagenesis and put them in plants to try and find out what regions are important. Here is a uh, member of the Avsun viroidae. This is peach latent mosaic viroid. So this infects peaches. Uh, these, by the names, um, the names suggest that they have a single host, but some of them infect multiple plants, not just one. You can see these Avsun viroidae have more extensive secondary structure, they're longer, and they encode the ribozyme. The ribozyme activity would cleave uh, this RNA right here. So it's a self-cleaving RNA, it's very interesting, and it's involved in the replication, as you'll see. So how do they replicate? So these RNAs get into a plant cell, we'll talk about how in a moment, they're copied by host RNA polymerase 2. That's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's our enzyme that makes messenger RNAs. And the viroid is copied, and you get concatamers made. So you have multiple copies of the RNA linked together. Uh, and then for some of the um, viroids, they're self-cleaved uh, by the hammerhead ribozyme. So that you make concatamers, which are then cleaved. Uh, and then the ribozyme activates them and, and they go on to move into other cells. So again, a ribozyme is a self-cleaving RNA sequence. This was discovered in 1981. It was a big surprise that RNAs could be catalytic, but of course, we also know that the, ribozyme, uh, the ribosome is also a catalytic RNA, can make proteins. And the one kind of uh, ribozyme is called the hammerhead ribozyme by virtue of the kind of structure that it forms. Again, these are self-cleaving RNAs, and um, during viroid replication, as you make concatamers, the hammerhead will release individual genomes. So some of the viroids do that, and the other viroids that don't have a ribozyme, uh, they used host enzymes to cleave the concatamers to form unit molecules. So let's see how this looks. This is a diagram of how the POSP viroid replicate. These are the smaller ones without a ribozyme sequence. And here's a plant cell uh, with a nucleus and a nucleolus. So the ribozymes enter the cell, they go right to the nucleus, they're circles, uh, and then they're transcribed into multimers. So the, if you remember rolling circle replication from some of our viruses, you start copying around a circle and you can just make many, many unit length molecules all joined together. So we're just showing two of them here. Uh, so those are copied uh, once and then twice uh, by nuclear enzymes. So you make the antigenome and then the genome. They go in the nucleus, uh, the nucleolus, uh, where a host enzyme will then cleave this concatamer into unit length molecules. They will circularize, get out of the nucleus, and then go on to the next cell. And you know that plant cells are connected by plasmodesmata, these, these uh, basically tunnels that lead from one cell to another. So the, the viroids travel from one cell to another this way. So they can enter an initial cell, replicate in it, and then the molecules will move on to the next and replicate again. And this way they distribute throughout the entire plant. They infect every cell and they cause their symptoms that way. So that's an example of the POSP viroid. Um, the key here, it's copied by Paul II and it's cleaved, the concatamers are cleaved by a host enzyme. Uh, the other is the, the other set of viroids, or the Avsun viroidae. Uh, these are the more complicated structures with a ribozyme activity. These again enter the cell. They go into the chloroplast, not the nucleus. And chloroplasts have their own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So this is a chloroplast and it copies, copies the viroid into an antigenome, uh, which is this is produced uh, this produces concatamers they're cleaved by the ribozyme activity they fold and then they're copied again to form the genomes concatamers again which are cleaved and then refold so slightly different replication but again the it's a host rna polymerase that's copying them but in this case the cleavage occurs uh, via a ribozyme that's built in to the viroid and these get out of the chloroplast and they move from cell to cell again through the plasmodesmata so you introduce these into plants, they take off, they replicate, they go right to the nucleus uh, and they make lots and lots of molecules and then move throughout the plants. Quite amazing. So where did they come from? We discovered them in 1967, but they've been around uh, for a long time. They've probably been in nature for millions of years. They're probably quite ancient. 
uh, but they were probably we think they originated in the 20th century um, when a, a, a viroid from a wild plant somehow contaminated uh, modern crop stocks. Um, you know, in the last hundred years or so, we've depended on monocultures for plants. We have very few uh, seed lines that give rise to the various plants that we grow for agriculture. And so at some point, not too long ago, one of these got contaminated, it got introduced into the field, and now it's very difficult to get rid of. So these are probably abundant in wild plants. Now they're in crops and they are very hard to get rid of. Um, they're transmitted mechanically, um, most likely farm machinery, farm equipment, farmer hands, even plant to plant. If you have a row of plants that are close together, there's some evidence that they can go from one to another. You, know, you, have, a, you have a tractor that's rolling through the fields, crushing plants. If there are viroids in them, a the tractor can take those into another field as well. So you can have an outbreak in a, uh, in a farm. It will wipe out the plants. You have to try and get rid of it by, by decontamination, but it's very difficult because these are outdoor um, farms and it's, it's hard to get rid of this. So, the, the outbreaks happen periodically. There's a lot of research going into trying preventing this. My view is that when we move farming indoors, which will happen soon, we're going to get rid of this kind of thing because the viroids won't be able to get inside. They'll be sufficiently contained that uh, they'll be clean enough so that we won't get these infections. How do they cause disease? So people worked on this for many years, and the answer is that probably it's microRNAs derived from the viroid RNA. So the viroid RNA gets into a plant cell. The cell has a uh, an e small inhibitory RNA-based defense system. Right? Plants don't make antibodies or cytotoxic T cells, but they have RNA-based immunity. And so a foreign RNA comes into a plant, it's immediately chopped up into 21 nucleotide fragments. And some of those end up silencing host genes. This is inadvertent, of course. The goal of the plant is to chop up the viroid, but it's a foreign RNA. But some of those small uh, RNAs, the 21 nucleotide silencing RNAs, silence host genes. And this is how we think that um, disease is produced. So the diseases correlate with the production of these small uh, RNAs. And these are these small RNAs that cause the silencing of the host cell genes. Now remember, they're silencing host cell mRNAs. That's what's causing the disease. These typically map to the regions of the viroid that we call pathogenesis regions. So it seems to be RNA silencing, although there's still a lot of work done to, to prove that this is a general phenomenon. Okay, so that's viroids. That's um, really interesting biology there. They're agriculturally important, so people continue to work on them. And uh, it's, they don't encode any proteins, so it's really amazing. They're parasites of transcription. They can replicate and persist in nature without encoding proteins. The next agents I want to talk about are called satellites. And these are slightly different. They can be single-stranded RNA, uh, they can be DNA, or they can be circular RNA. So it's a variety of different configurations. And the de defining characteristic here is that they depend on a helper virus for propagation. That's the reason we call them satellite. And there are two different classes, if you will. We have satellite viruses. So here, the genome encodes structural proteins, and these encapsulate the genome, so we actually get a, a virus particle made. But that virus particle cannot replicate on its own. It still depends on a helper virus being present to provide uh, enzymes needed for replication. All right, so those are satellite viruses. Then we have satellite RNAs, which don't encode any capsid proteins, so they cannot be packaged on their own. Uh, and they are uh, packaged by helper viruses. Uh, and again, the helper viruses provide functions for replication. So these, um, these molecules, whether they be RNA or DNA, they do encode some protein, but they don't have the whole complement of proteins that they would need to be an autonomous virus, that is, an, a virus able to get in a cell on its own and replicate. They need a helper virus. So very much like viroids, satellites cause disease in plants. Um, 
And this is a kind of disease that we don't see with the helper virus on its own. So the helper plus the satellite causes a very different kind of disease. And the kinds of symptoms include necrosis, uh, the destruction of the plant, or chlorosis. Chlorosis is reduced chlorophyll. You can see that nicely in this picture. The top is a normal plant. All the leaves are green. And on the bottom, there's reduced chlorophyll, so they're yellow. That's called chlorosis, and this is caused by uh, the satellite virus. So these are unique sequences. They're not related to the helper in any way. They're not somehow defective or deleted viruses derived from the helper. They are totally different. There's no homology in sequence between the satellite, either the virus or the RNA, and the helper virus. Here are some examples of satellite viruses. Uh, just, so just three out of many. And you can see I've, I've given examples of uh, vertebrate, animal, and plant um, satellites. Here is one, uh, the, here in the left column is the helper virus and, and the name of the satellite. So the helper for adeno-associated virus can be adenovirus or herpes virus. So adeno-associated virus is a parvovirus. These are single-stranded DNA viruses, which we talked about uh, before. They encode capsid proteins, but they can't replicate without being co-infected with adenovirus or herpes virus. Uh, these are single-stranded DNA viruses, satellites, I should say. Uh, this is the size of the particle. The genome is 4,700 nucleotides. It encodes a couple of capsid proteins, and these infect vertebrates. So adeno-associated viruses like canine parvovirus that we talked about last time, um, adeno-associated virus vectors. Uh, these are used in gene therapy, as we'll see later. And you need to always have a helper virus to make these vector preparations. Next is a virus of bees, a satellite of bees. So the satellite is called chronic bee paralysis virus satellite. And the, the helper is chronic bee paralysis virus. And you can tell what this virus does to bees, paralyzes them, right? The satellite makes a different disease. These are single-stranded RNA satellites, 17 nanometer particles. 1,100 nucleotide genome. They encode a single capsid protein. And uh, of course, th this capsid protein encapsidates uh, this particular satellite. I'm not showing you any satellites that are simply RNA satellites, um, just ones that encode their own capsid proteins. Then we have an example of a plant satellite. This is the tobacco necrosis virus satellite. Again, single-stranded RNA, small particle, small genome, capsid protein infects plants. So again, Tobacco necrosis virus on its own will infect plants and cause disease. Uh, in the presence of the satellite, the disease is different, sometimes more severe. Now, there is one human satellite virus that we know of anyway, and that's called hepatitis delta virus. It's sort of a mix between viroids and satellites, as you will see. It's a satellite because it needs a helper virus to replicate, and the helper is hepatitis B virus. So you can acquire hepatitis B virus infection, of course. We talked about that somewhat. It's a chronic virus infection of the liver that leads to hepatitis and sometimes uh, liver cancer. You can also be co-infected with he hepatitis B virus and hepatitis delta virus. And we think that when, you ha when you're co-infected with the satellite and the hepatitis B virus, your disease is more severe. So you have to be co-infected. You can't, you don't get Hep B first and then Delta later. Delta doesn't get transmitted on its own because it wouldn't be able to replicate. It has to be transmitted along with Hepatitis B virus. Uh, this is the global distribution of Hepatitis Delta. So it was discovered after Hepatitis B virus was discovered. Uh, and about 18 million people or so are infected, which is 5% of the 350 million carriers of hepatitis B virus. It was originally found in Europe, uh, but it seems to be declining there. It's extremely prevalent in the Asia Pacific region. You can see the very high countries of prevalence, uh, intermediate and low. This is what the genome looks like. Here on the top is the genome. It is, it does encode a protein and the genome is negative stranded. So it's got that olive color. And you see it's extensively base paired so in that sense, it looks like a viroid. Those RNA molecules are circular, extensively base paired. Uh, the complement is shown here. This is the antigenome. Of course, you have to make a complement in order to replicate. 
uh, this genome. And this RNA, it's 1.7 kilobase, it has a ribozyme in it. It's a self-cleaving sequence shown right here. So in that sense, it's like that class of viroids that have a ribozyme activity. So the structure of the RNA and the presence of a ribozyme make it viroid-like, but of course it encodes a protein and it needs a helper, so those make it satellite-like. Uh, in infected cells, um, you get a lot of copies of the genome, a lot of, of the antigenome, although less, and then some copies of an mRNA, which is produced from the genome, so that's a plus-stranded mRNA and it has a single open reading frame in it for delta antigen. And two different kinds of uh, delta antigens are produced from this mRNA, uh, the large and the small delta antigens. So a single protein is encoded by this uh, satellite. Um, you'll see what that protein does in a moment, but again, the satellite cannot replicate uh, on its own. It needs uh, uh, hepatitis B virus, and specifically for encapsidation. So the delta genome, again shown at the top, is actually encapsidated in the hepatitis B virus uh, particle, if you will. So on the right is the hepatitis B virus that we've talked about before. It's an icosahedral nucleocapsid with that weird gapped uh, double-stranded DNA genome. And then it's surrounded by an envelope. And then in the envelope there are different forms of the hepatitis B virus glycoprotein, this, the small, medium, and large forms. And remember, if you produce uh, one of these forms by itself, it assembles into a particle, and that's what the hepatitis B vaccine is. The delta particle uses these uh, hepatitis B virus surface glycoproteins to make a particle. So it's also enveloped with the hep, uh, hep B glycoproteins in it. And in addition, the large and small delta antigens are needed to get uh, the genome of delta encapsidated. So the small delta antigen coats the RNA and the large seems to uh, allow it to attach to uh, the membrane vesicle. So you can see the small delta uh, the large delta is actually embedded in the membrane uh, in between the, the hepatitis B virus protein. So the delta helps the delta genome be packaged into the hepatitis B virus particle. There's no hep B genome in here. It's excluded. It's just the hepatitis delta. So this, this particle, you might predict, would bind the same receptors as hepatitis B because it's got the same glycoproteins, and it's correct. The, the receptor for hepatitis B and delta viruses are exactly the same. Now this, when this RNA enters a cell, it's replicated by polymerase II of the host cell, very much like uh, viroids. So here's the negative strand genome RNA coming into the cell. It's a circular single-stranded RNA. It's recognized by DNA, RNA polymerase II, so a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, our enzyme that makes mRNAs will recognize this. So, you know, in the beginning of this course, I talk about how RNA viruses always have to encode a polymerase because there's no cell enzyme that can copy their genome, right? The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of those viruses doesn't exist in the cell. But this is one example of a viral RNA, a satellite RNA, that can be copied by the host cell. It's the only one we know of. And I don't know why this is copyable. You know, poliovirus RNA is not copyable by Pol2. Influenza RNA is not, it's just delta for some reason. Anyway, the Pol2 copies it, makes the antigenome, which is green, and this occurs by rolling circle replication, if you will. You make tandem copies, so multiple copies linked together. The red is the self cleavage site, and so uh, these molecules can self cleave to form unit length molecules, uh, and they can give rise to the mRNAs, the plus strand give rise to the mRNA. Uh, there is a polyadenylation sequence uh, in this mRNA, so it can get cleaved right there and released from the, the plus strand genome. Uh, then you can make full length plus strands, which are not uh, cleaved at the poly A site. These circularize, and then they're copied again to make negative strands, again by this rolling circle mechanism. And again, the, the ribozyme releases the unit length genome so they can circularize and then go on uh, to be encapsidated, so to speak. All right. So it's relatively straightforward. Copied by Paul II, tandem rolling circle repeats. The ribozyme separates out the, the full length plus or minus strands, depending on where you are. Uh, and the ribozyme 
uh, and the polyadenylation site is responsible for cleavage and production of the mRNA. So this, this satellite needs Paul 2 for replication of his genome, and it needs hepatitis B virus to provide the protein coat. Okay, so that's, that's the one satellite that we know of in human cells. All the other ones are you know, plants or other sorts of uh, vertebrates. The next category of unusual agents uh, is virophages. I don't know if this is separate or not. This is an interesting question. So virophages are recently uh, assigned name to this group of, of viruses. And the name comes from bacteriophage. Phagen is Greek meaning to eat. And they're called virophages because in the initial experiments, they interfered with the replication of their helper virus. So they were called virus eaters. Um, I don't really like this name at all. I don't like virophage. I don't like the concept of a virus uh, eating another one. Um, this was originated in a French laboratory, so we'll chalk it up to the French uh, unusual point of view of the world, right? But <laughs> I think virus eater is wrong. I think they're satellites to a certain extent, but we'll see. So these are bigger viruses than we've talked about. They're circular double-stranded <laughs> DNA viruses, and they're packaged in icosahedral particles. They need a helper. The helper for these happen to be giant viruses, not uh, hepatitis B, which is not so big, but the really big ones, the Mimi viruses, Pandora viruses that we've talked about, um, they need to be, they can only replicate in cells infected with those viruses, and they interfere with the helper virus replication. So if you put a satellite, a, a virophage in a cell with a giant virus with its helper, the yield of the helper virus goes down substantially. All right, so that's, it's a little different. Some some of the traditional satellites do that as well, so that's not unusual. But what's unusual here is that these are rather large, as you will see. So here are some of the virophages that have been uh, identified. Um, the first one was uh, called Sputnik, and this was isolated from a cooling tower in Paris, you know, so they named it virophage over there in France. The, um, the helper virus is Mimi virus, which replicates apparently in amoeba, uh, and um, so this Sputnik is a satellite of uh, Mimi virus. This has a big genome, 18,000 base pairs, and it, can, it encodes at least 21 different proteins. And then there's a bunch of other quite interesting ones here. Um, they're all from large DNA viruses. Cafeteria Rowan Bergensis is, is a very large virus. This one was found off the coast of Texas. As you can see, it's quite big. They're all big genomes and encode a lot of proteins. Um, Here's an interesting one. Uh, Sputnik 2 was isolated from the contact lens fluid of a patient with keratitis in France. So they called it lentille virus. Oh, cute lens, right? So uh, that is okay. I like lentille virus. This, so this patient had an eye infection, right? And so they looked in his or her uh, contact lens case, and they found um, this, this Sputnik 2 in it. Uh, and um, the, the helper is lentille virus, and it's big as well. And then there are a bunch from Yellowstone Lake, uh, which are, their helpers are viruses that infect uh, algae. And some un unusual environments as well, a lake in Antarctica, a hypersaline lake in Antarctica here. So you can see they're distributed all over the world. We find these virophages everywhere. So they're not special to one environment. They're pretty much everywhere, uh, so they're probably important. This is the structure of one of them shown on the right here. So it's a very nice icosahedral capsid with all the symmetry and rules that we've talked about in this course. And this is a capsid protein encoded in the uh, viral phage genome. On the left are electron micrographs of the effect of these uh, viral phages on virus replication. So this is Sputnik in cells infected with Mimi virus. So um, these are all pretty weird things going on here. So here's a cell. Uh, infected with Mimi virus, this on the upper left. These are Mimi viruses, these big guys here. The Sputnik are the smaller particles uh, that you can see here with the arrows, okay? Now, uh, like many big DNA viruses, these Mimi viruses replicate in the cytoplasm in factories. They make a, a factory where they do everything. And the, the uh, virophages, the Sputniks, actually replicate in the virus factory set up by the Mimi virus. So they have to be right there, presumably because they need proteins that are made by the helper. These other photos show you some of the weird effects 
of Sputnik on Mimi virus. So remember, Sputnik inhibits Mimi virus production. So here in the upper right, this is a Mimi virus particle full of Sputnik. So it's obviously defective. The Sputniks are somehow inside of it. Uh, then also they cause these long uh, structures to be formed. So here on the bottom left is a Mimi virus, and here's one where the capsid is aberrant. Here's another one with layers and layers of of protein apparently. So normally these Mimi viruses are fuzzy. They have these hairs sticking out of them, but you can see half of this particle is messed up. So these uh, virophages and cause a lot of aberrant replications and that's why they inhibit the replication of these giant viruses. So what are these doing? A couple, we have a couple of hints. Um, th this virus, Ma virus, is a virophage of a giant virus that infects an organism called Cafeteria roenbergensis. All right? That's it right up in the upper right. This is such a cool organism, right? It's beautiful. This is a marine phagotropic flagellate. It's a flagellated organism, single cell, and it eats lots of stuff in the ocean. That's why they call it cafeteria. It eats everything it can find, all right? And this is probably one of the most numerous um, organisms in the ocean, aside from viruses, of course. Anyway, the Ma virus is a virophage of a virus that infects cafeteria. It's called Cafeteria roenbergensis virus. And so there's, there's some idea that these um, virophages may be regulating virus lethality in these populations because they can protect the host from virus lysis. There's a virophage that was found in big DNA viruses called phycodenoviruses. These infect algae. Uh, this was found in Organic Lake, which is a lake in Antarctica. And in that particular environment, you know, there's not a lot of light in Antarctica for most of the year. And the, the waters that are down there are not very complex. They don't have a lot of microbial life because there's not a lot of light to produce all the uh, materials that are needed for other organisms to live. And these virophages seem to modulate virus killing of the algae. Uh, to compensate for low light levels. It's quite an interesting ecological problem. Uh, so we think these virophages may help maintain stable uh, communities of various eukaryotes. We think they help exchange genes. We can find their sequences scattered among all different sorts of hosts. And so we think they have a major impact on ocean ecology. So this is a really just growing area of research where we're going to find out in the next 10 years or so what these um, exactly these organisms are doing. So are these satellites? They were, when they were originally found, they were classified as satellites, but the people who work on them uh, objected to that. It's a very interesting um, thread of papers concerning this. They say they're too big and they're too complicated. Satellites are these little things that can't do very much on their own, and these are almost viruses. So one way to look at this is very interesting. So these uh, virophages, require a helper because the helper provides transcriptional machinery that the virophage uses. And that's why uh, the virophage has to replicate in the factory produced by the helper virus. So they're transcriptional parasites. Many other viruses that are co considered autonomous are parasites of the host cell transcriptional machinery, like SV40, right? It needs the host cell uh, polymerase system in order to replicate. We don't call SV40 a a satellite of host cells. It's a parasite of host cells. So their argument is that virophages shouldn't be called satellites just because they require a transcriptional system made by another virus. I don't know what the answer is. They're clearly different, and we'll probably have to uh, rename what a satellite actually is. <clears throat> or the other interesting agent today I want to talk about are prions. Uh, these are infectious proteins that don't have any nucleic acids. Can you believe there's a road somewhere called Prion Road? Isn't that great? So Prion is an artificial name, protein and infectious, yet there's a road. I don't know which came first. This is great. Anyway, Prions are in the news a lot. Uh, BSC, mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt, Jakob, Scrapey, Kuru. Chronic wasting disease now is, a, is the most recent one. And there was a Nobel Prize awarded for the work on, on Prions to Stanley Prusiner in 1997. So this is a, a subject, an infectious agent that is very much liked by journalists. These agents cause transmissible spongy form encephalopathies. Big word, okay? Encephalopathy is a disease of the brain. 
Transmissible is obvious. It can be transmitted. It's an infectious agent. And these are neurodegenerative disorders uh, of mammals. We'll get into this, the pathology in just a moment. Um, every year there are quite a few humans diagnosed with these infections, um, about uh, thousands anyway, and 1% of those are caused by infection. So they're not all transmitted by infectious roots, as you will see. And BSE is a, a disease of cows, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And uh, a number of humans have contracted this infection by eating the meat of these animals. You cannot destroy the protein by cooking it, so it's easy to acquire it if you eat an animal that's already infected. So we'll talk about that uh, as well. So these are the different TSEs. So TSE, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. I'm going to keep calling them TSE. Uh, here we have various non-human animal diseases, BSE. Uh, chronic wasting disease, of, this happens in deer, elk, and moose. Exotic ungulate encephalopathy. That's, this is uh, one of these ungulates. This is a Nyala here. They get it. Cats get it. Feline spongiform. Not just your little cat at home, but lions and tigers, they get it. Uh, sheep and goats get a disease called scrapie, and minks get it as well. So it's quite prevalent. And humans get a number of different diseases that all fall under the heading of TSEs. Kreutzfeld Jakob, fatal familial insomnia, Gerstmann Straussler, Kuru and variant CJD. And we'll talk about some of these and how they arise. <clears throat> so the fact that spongiform is in the name, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, this reflects the fact that people or animals who develop these diseases, their brain develops sponge-like holes throughout it, which you can imagine is not good. So these are serious diseases. You get psychomotor dysfunctions, you get dementias, uh, you have ataxias of various sorts, and every disease has a different set of symptoms associated with it, um, depending on where the brain is damaged. So every agent has a slightly different predilection for the brain and slightly different uh, symptoms. But they're all basically neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So this is a section of brain from, I think this is a sheep with scrapie, uh, and these are holes that are the spongiform, where spongiform gets its name from. So in a normal section from sheep brain, you would not see holes like this, right? These are the various brain cells, the glia and the neurons in here, and, and these should be all filled in. So s somehow in this disease, these, these holes occur, and that's why we call them spongiform, because this is a characteristic of the disease, no matter whether it's in human or animals, and no matter what the agent is. The first TSC recognized was scrapie. This is a disease of sheep. Here's a sheep with scrapie. Uh, and they, one of their characteristics is that they rub themselves on fences. They remove their, their um, what is it? Is it fur or hair in sheep? Does anybody know? Wool, wool thank you. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> so they, they lose their wool, you can see, by scraping against the fence. So the farmers called it scrapie as a consequence. So the, the sheep. Um, have motor disturbances, they, they walk uh, unsteadily, they tremble. This is a common characteristic. In fact, uh, in Canada, it was called tremblant du mouton as a disease. They get paralyzed, they lose weight, and then they die within four to six weeks. Always fatal. And this has been known in European sheep for a long time. Uh, and to this day, it's endemic. In, in the UK, 1% of sheep every year develop scrapie. Okay? So this is a this is potentially a problem, as you will see. So the sheep farmers were really smart. Um, they found, they observed, so they were epidemiologists. They observed that the disease could be transmitted from a sick sheep to a healthy herd. You know, they saw that within their uh, herd, if they moved the sick sheep in with others, the others would get sick. Or if they gave their neighbor a sick sheep, nice guy, right? You give your neighbor a sick sheep that would transmit the infection to those sheep as well. So it looked like it was an infectious agent. In 1939, an experiment was done where they took sheep brain uh, from these sick animals. They ground it up and they filtered it through a small filter, which will pass only viruses, right? 0.2 micron filter. And the agent went through the filter. So they could take that extract and infect new sheep with it 
uh, and it went through the filter, so it was thought that it might be a virus at the time. However, the agent was turned out to be highly resistant to ultraviolet irradiation, which would irradiate most viruses, ionizing radiation, and formaldehyde. You know, if we, we inactivate viruses routinely with formaldehyde, but it didn't inactivate whatever was in the brain extract that transmitted the infection. So very early on, this agent was thought to just consist of a protein, no nucleic acid, uh, because otherwise it would have been inactivated by uh, these treatments. So this is a graph of the uh, molecular weight of various viruses uh, versus the dose of radiation that's needed to inactivate infectivity. So we have uh, on the top curve, we have various DNA viruses. And so at the top left, we have viruses, DNA viruses with big genomes like herpes viruses and, and phages, vaccinia virus. And you don't, you don't need much radiation to inactivate infectivity. The genome is a big target and you just need one hit to inactivate infectivity. So a big genome, you don't need very much uh, radiation. As the genome gets smaller, here we have SV40 and polyoma. Um, it's harder to inactivate the genome because it's simply a small target. So you need more radiation, higher dose. And at the bottom here are RNA viruses which have a separate curve of their own. But again, larger RNA viruses are bigger targets, easier to inactivate. As you get smaller, you need more radiation. But the scrapie agent falls all the way down here. Uh, it needs a lot of irradiation to inactivate it, more than any known virus. And so this is one of the reasons why it was thought not to be a viral agent at all. <clears throat> now, after a while, we began to recognize that humans also develop TSEs. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and they were they were probably the same disease or similar disease as that observed in sheep. Both the animal and the human TSEs have very similar abnormalities in the brain. They have a, very, a variety of defects which uh, are listed here. Plasma membrane de defects, vacuolization, uh, loss of neurons, the spongy form appearance which I showed you, and the accumulation of glial fibrillary acidic, acidic protein in clumps and amyloidosis, that is fibrils of amyloid precursor protein foid, uh, form in the brain. So these are common among both human and animal TSEs, and this suggested that there was a common mechanism in the pathogenesis. So experimentally, we can transmit this disease from an infected animal to another animal by injecting uh, homogenates, as I've shown you. We can filter them and inject them into the animal. The animals will develop the signs of the disease ataxia, difficulty walking, dementia, eventually death. And this can be after months or years. Um, the agent, depending on how you inoculate, you can feed it to animals sometimes. It will uh, accumulate in the, the lymph system and spread to the CNS. You can also inject it directly into the brain, in which case it, it acts more rapidly. And as I said, the, the CNS pathology includes these various uh, cellular losses. Interestingly, when you inject an animal with this, there's no inflammatory response. You remember the inflammation, you know, the production of cytokines, the cells that come in to an infected area, you don't see any of that. There's no antibody produced against anything new, and there's no cellular immune response. There are no CTLs, there are no NK cells, there's no antibody response. And as you'll see, this makes sense because this is one of our proteins that's causing this disease. So TSEs are really serious. They're relatively rare, but we can't so far detect them until you have symptoms. You will start developing, you know, the altered gait and so forth and eventually proceed to dementia. Uh, and we can't do anything for you at that point. They're untreatable. Um, and all of these individuals die. Anyone who is diagnosed with a TSC, invariably fatal. Um, the one example I know of, uh, many, so the New York City Ballet used to be run by George Balanchine, very famous choreographer, and he, at one point, uh, he, would be, he wore these jackets with leather patches on the arms, and one of his assistants noticed at one point the hallways to his office, they had patches of leather on the wall where he would be bumping into the walls because he, he started having trouble walking, and this got worse and worse and he was eventually diagnosed with one of these TSEs. And of course, he died from it. 
So the agent of these diseases are called prions for proteinaceous infectious particles. As early as 1967, a, a mathematician named Griffith, he said these have to be uh, protein because all the data says there's no nucleic acid. But there wasn't any proof for that until 1981. Stanley Prusiner, uh, he had been studying this disease. He made extracts of sheep brains, sheep with scrapie, showed you could transmit it to other animals. He eventually purified the agent responsible for the disease, and it was a protein. And this purified protein could transmit to the, the disease to other animals. So you take a, a brain homogenate from scrapie infected sheep, you purify a single protein from it, and you inject that into another animal, and it will cause disease. So he showed a protein was responsible for this disease. And he called them prions, which stands for proteinaceous and infectious particles. Now, to this day, there are skeptics who don't believe this and who think there's a nucleic acid buried in there somewhere. But these, this is nonsense, because as you will see, the evidence is quite strong that this is what's causing the disease. This protein, the prion protein causing this disease, is encoded by the PRNP gene. All right, everybody has a PRNP gene. It's a gene that encodes a protein that has a normal function in the central nervous system. And that gene is essential for the development of the disease. I'm going to show you the evidence for that uh, in a moment. Our current view is that the disease state of the prion is a conformational isoform of a normal host protein. So the host protein is called PRPC, C is cellular. This is encoded by the PRNP gene. And the pathogenic form is called PRPSC. SC stands for scrapie in honor of the sheep where it was first uh, discovered. So PRPC has a function in the brain. It's on neurons. It has a GPI anchor. Um, we, it is not essential because you can knock the gene out in mice, but it has some role in uh, neurological function. So you take an animal with PRPC. We all have PRPC. If you introduce, uh, say, an, a, a scrapie extract from a, a scrapie-infected sheep or a, sh a sheep with scrapie disease, the PRPSC will get into the brain of the recipient and convert the PRPC into PRPSC. Okay. So this is how the disease works. So you, you somehow acquire PRPSC, and it turns your PRPC into more PRPSC, and this PRPSC causes the disease. So it's a very interesting templating of a, of a new form of the protein. So these are conformational isoforms. This is the normal form, PRPC, and the pathogenic form is PRPSC. So here's how these proteins look. Uh, here on the top right, is the structure of the PRPC protein. This has been solved by X-ray crystallography. And you see there are two very nice uh, alpha helices and two uh, beta sheets or beta strands. This PRPC gets converted to PRPSC by exogenous PRPSC. And we don't know the structure of PRPSC. It's a really difficult protein to work with. We can't solve the structure, but we know it's different from PRPC, has a lot of uh, beta sheet structure. So that's shown on here as these triangles of beta strands. All right, lots of beta sheet structure. And this is the pathogenic conformation. Now this, the difference between these two proteins can be detected in the laboratory by protease digestion. And that's shown on the left. If you take PRPC and digest it with a proteinase called proteinase K, it digests proteins, it will completely digest the protein. So if you ran a Western blot of untreated and treated PRPC, the PRPC would go away. But the PRPSC, if you do the same treatment, only a little bit of, of it is digested, uh, the end terminus here at the left, and the rest is proteinase K resistant because of this extended beta strand structure, and you end up with a 27 kilodalton form. So you can actually take extracts of animal brain and run them on a gel, do a Western blot, and probe with antibodies, and you can see when this um, PRPSC arises because it's resistant to proteolysis. But this, this is not an easy diagnostic. You need brain tissue, and so you can't use this, obviously, for living people. But anyway, it's been a good experimental method for distinguishing the two proteins. Now, now once Stanley Prusiner identified 
the protein, and then he said he cloned the gene, PRNP, that encodes it. He could then make mice that lack the gene, that lack the PRNP gene. Okay, so these mice live, they're healthy, they don't seem to have any uh, abnormalities. They lack the PRNP gene, it's been knocked out. And these mice are resistant to infection. If you give mice, say, as you'll see in a moment, you give mice cow PRPSC, uh, the mice will get infected. But if you knock out PRNP in the mice, they will not get infected. So the host PRNP gene is essential for acquiring um, this disease. All right, so if we, all, if we could get rid of our PRNP gene, and someday someone's going to try this with CRISPR, um, we might all be resistant to this disease. But we may have other issues because we may need PRNP, right? Now, you can acquire this disease by infection. You can somehow uh, ingest or acquire PRPSC by contamination. I'll show you how in a moment. And that's where we got the infectious nature of this disease. But it also turns out that there are mutations that you may inherit from your parents that predispose you to this disease. So you don't have to actually be infected with PRPSC. You will spontaneously change your PRPC to PRPSC and develop this disease. So whether you introduce the PRPSC into an animal or you acquire the disease uh, genetically, uh, this protein accumulates in the CNS and that gives you the symptoms of the disease. We don't actually understand how the protein does that, but this is what we, we know that the protein's presence causes the symptoms of TSEs. So there are three types of TSEs, uh, spongiform encephalopathies, I should say, because they're technically not all transmissible. So there's the infectious or transmissible form, um, which you can acquire through contaminated material or by eating contaminated animals. There's the familial form or genetic. You, in, you inherit from your parents mutations in the PRNP gene that predispose it to misfolding so it becomes PRPSC. All right, and then there's sporadic, where you don't eat a diseased animal, you have no genetics in your family that makes you predisposed, your PRPC just misfolds one day and you start to develop uh, this TSE. All right, so they're all the same disease in the sense that they're based around the PRNP gene product, and no matter how they arise, they, the disease can be transmitted by putting material in uh, another animal or by ingesting it. But they arise in three different ways. So let's talk about uh, some of the different kinds of human TSEs. The, the infectious or the transmissible one uh, was really the first one that we detected. Uh, it was first found uh, in New Guinea by, um, it was called Kuru, and I'll tell you the story of that uh, in a moment. You can also acquire this TSE uh, from, by iatrogenic spread, uh, spread from contaminated procedures. So many individuals have gotten corneal transplants or hormone treatments or transfusions from people who had CJG, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, which is one of these TSEs, and these individuals didn't know it. And they, and they were given uh, unknowingly the TSE. So the corneas, for example, are from donors, people who die of other causes. You don't know they have CJ, but they do. There are prions, PRPSC, and the corneas. You implant them, and they go into that person and give them CJ. Um, other, other ophthalmological procedures have also been shown to transmit these infections. You cannot autoclave a a, a, a ophthalmological tool and get rid of these. It won't, it won't be destroyed, so it's very dangerous. So you can acquire it also by eating infected cattle. BSE is a disease of cattle that arose when uh, people started feeding ground up sheep to cattle. The sheep had scrapie and they were just thrown in a mixer and ground up and fed to the cows and the cows get BSE and then humans who ate the cows got it in, in turn. And this is called variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob. Brand new disease, very different from regular Kreutzfeldt-Jakob. Uh, and you get it from eating BSE beef. We'll come back to that in a moment. So we'll start with Kuru. This was the first um, human TSC recognized. So by this time, we knew about scrapie. And uh, there was a disease in the four people of New Guinea right here, which was um, 
basically a fatal encephalopathy, very much like the TSEs we've been talking about, 30-year incubation period. And, it, and a virologist, Carlton Gaidusek, went to study these individuals to see if he could figure out what was going on. And it looked like it was an infectious agent, looked like a TSE. <coughs> what he found is that it spread through this tribe by, by cannibalism. So when someone died, the women and children got to eat the brain and they would acquire the prions by contamination. So they would eat the brain and ingest the PRPSC. So the idea would be that the, some of the people who died had these TSEs and they were transmitted to them. So Guy Dussek and others convinced them to stop this practice, this ritual cannibalism, and then the disease went away. So there's no longer any more Kuru in, in, um, in these individuals. And so this is a TSE spread probably for many years, maybe years ago, someone developed a spontaneous uh, prion disease, right, where your protein misfolds and they died of it, and then that just got transmitted through the tribe uh, by this cannibalism. <clears throat> so that's, that's a form of infectious TSC, right? You're eating contaminated brain. This is the sporadic Kreutzfeld Jakob. Uh, this is the most common right now. This is where the disease just appears with no risk factors. The, the number is one to two per million humans worldwide. So that's quite a few people. Every, this is per year. Uh, they're usually 50 to 70 years old and accounts for 65% of human TSE. So the others are familial and infectious. No warning, no epidemiological indications, you haven't eaten a contaminated cow, you haven't had a procedure that's given you any contamination, you have a normal PRNP gene. You can transmit this to others um, if you say you're early on in the incubation and you donate blood, there are prions in there, not, what, not easy for us to detect them. We don't screen the blood supply for prions and you can transmit the infection to others. So it, even though it arose spontaneously, the protein is still transmissible. And we think, as I said, that Kuru was probably established by some, eating the brain of that first person with sporadic CJ many years ago. And then it just got passed on by infection. Familial is the third kind where you have, this is an inherited disease. It's, it's an autosomal dominant mutation in the PRNP gene. So you need one copy of your gene to have certain mutations. And these are... Um, very specific amino acid changes. We know from sequencing a number of individuals exactly where in the protein the amino acid changes need to be. So you could, you could in fact have your genome sequenced and you look at your PRNP gene and see if you're at risk for developing uh, a TSE. Not that you can do anything about it. There's no treatment, but maybe you'd like to know if you're going to develop one or not. So, um, now if you, if you develop um, a, a familial form of this disease or sporadic form, you can, as I said, you can transmit this infection to other people, especially early on before you have symptoms where you do have prions in your blood or in your tissues, uh, you can transmit it via these uh, transplants, blood products, organ donations, and so forth. All right. So this is a graph to show you uh, the numbers in the U.S. This is Kreutzfeld Jakob, um, age-adjusted deaths from 79 to 2011. So here we're going from zero to 450. Um, so, you know, there is a, a gradual increase as the population uh, increases here, uh, but roughly, you know, hundreds uh, per year in the U.S. So it's, it's a rare disease. This is considered a rare disease, but because it's uniformly fatal um, and it will likely increase as the population ages, people are working on trying to get uh, therapies. So again, we have, this is just a summary of what I've told you. Here we have our normal PRPC protein. There are three ways you can get these TSEs. You can somehow acquire the, the, the misfolded protein by an infectious route, either by a transplanted cornea, by eating food, and that causes your PRPSC to misfold. You can inherit a mutation in the PRPC gene, so it misfolds and becomes PRPSC. Or there's this uh, spontaneous disease where the protein simply misfolds without any predisposition. Now, if you, if you, the, the image on the left sort of is a theory of how you would acquire these. Um, of course, the sporadic and the genetic TSEs, they just arise within you and the proteins propagate in your brain. But if you ingest um, 
say, contaminated meat, the, the, the prions, the contaminated prions, the PRPSC are going to go into your gut. And on the surface of your gut cells, there is also PRPC. So the conversion probably begins in your gut. Here's the gut epithelial cells, which we've talked about in terms of virus infections. Uh, and then we think the, the PRPSC proteins uh, then penetrate the epithelium and make their way into the uh, enteric nerve system and then propagate their ways up to the CNS. So this is highly hypothetical, but it's just an idea of how eating uh, one of these proteins might lead to infection. Somehow that protein has to get into uh, the CNS, and it probably does so by being initially amplified there uh, in the gut. Now, the, the, this new disease in cows, BSE, arose because of cannibalism, just like the Kuru epidemic. So the cows were given uh, a certain feed. Now, in Europe, cows don't have the luxury of, of grazing on grass, so they have to feed them protein so that they develop faster. And at some point, they started feeding the cows ground up uh, animals that hadn't been treated properly, and so the scrapie agent, was, you know, there were scrapie sheep in there, and so the cows started developing uh, their own form of a TSC called BSE. It's called mad cow disease also. Um, so this what resulted from the practice of feeding processed animal byproducts, including sheep, as protein supplements. Uh, and this began in the 70s. The method of preparation was changed, and that allowed the scrapie agent to get in there. It hadn't been the, the method of prep previously would, would have prevented the scrapie agent from getting in. We, we figured this out in retrospect. And eventually they stopped feeding cows this kind of prep prepared meat and the, the epidemic stopped as well. And people who ate these cows, there's, there's epidemiological evidence that they acquired this new disease called CJD uh, from eating contaminated cows. This is creutzfeldt jakob but the characteristics are different enough, it has a younger age, age incidence, shorter incubation period, and different pathogenesis. So we think this was acquired from uh, the cows who had BSE. So this is a graph of, of this outbreak. So this happened in the UK. Uh, here's the incidence of BSE in cows. So starting at about 88, you see an increase in the number of cows. And this is just 30, 35, it's not a lot but it got into the food supply, and then a number of years later, here in blue are the, the incidence of uh, human uh, Kreutzfeld, variant Kreutzfeld-Jakob. Uh, the ban on the meat was, in, it was instilled, the cow uh, outbreak stopped, and eventually the human cases as well. All right, now the problem with cows is that um, the, the disease has an incubation time of about five years, but you slaughter cows after they're two or three years old for meat purposes, so you don't really know if they have the disease and that's why this got into the human food chain. We still have cases of BSE in cattle. These are probably sporadic. So just like people, the cows can sporadically develop a TSE. There are lots of cows that we are raising globally, so we try and protect the food supply. It's not easy because we don't check every cow for, for BSE. We're trying to develop diagnostic tests and uh, make drugs that would be good for treating uh, prions. Uh, so since that outbreak in the UK, this is just a graph that gives you an idea of how many cows are still getting BSE in North America from 93 to the present. So, you, you know, the numbers here are from zero to six um, and just a few every year in the US and Canada. And there's no link. We don't use this kind of feed preparation, neither does Canada. So these are probably sporadic developments in cows. So the, obviously the worry is this will get into the food supply because this cow will develop this disease, you won't be able to tell until they're slaughtered and people acquire the infection. So whenever there is a cow uh, diagnosed with this, it causes a lot of consternation. It's an interesting diagnostic test that has just been developed to detect prions. You can't do PCR, of course, because there's no nucleic acid. But what they do is they, they found out that the prions in people with these diseases are in the nasal cavity, so they can do a nasal uh, sampling of the neuroepithelium. So it's way up there. You have to get where the, um, uh, you know, the olfactory cells come out into the nasal cavity and it turns out the prions are spreading from the brain there. And then you put this in a test tube uh, and you add, you take your um, sample and you add uh, some scrapey prions to it. Uh, and, and these will form monomers uh, of the protein which are uh, basically essentially what's happening in vivo. So you, you incubate this and you get a long polymer of the proteins produced, you then sonicate it to break it up, uh, and then you, you can get more amplification of these individual fragments. So this is very sensitive and can detect prions uh, in people. 
and in cows. So the hope is they can go through a cow herd and see if any of them have prions in their noses. An important consideration for prions is this species barrier. Um, it's not always the case that putting a disease brain extract into a different species will cause disease. If you go from the same species to the same species that works, but into different species is inefficient, and that's because the sequences have to match usually. So whoever, if you're taking a cow prion, the best is to go into another cow uh, to get disease. Now it turns out that cow prions have a very broad host range, so you can actually infect uh, mice with cow prions. So here's an example of the species barrier. You take a hamster prion, PRPSC, you infect a, a normal mouse, you get no disease because the mouse doesn't have hamster prion. But if you make a transgenic mouse, which is, now has the hamster PRNP gene, you can infect these mice with hamster PRPSC and they will develop disease. So having a match in the host is important for propagation of the disease. But it's not always the case. Sometimes mismatches work like cow into people obviously works. So cow prions have a very broad host range. If you take um, cow PRPSC and infect mice, they get sick. Normal mice without the cow gene. So this cow prion has a broad host range and that's why we're worried uh, about BSC because it can overcome the host range. There's another recently discovered uh, disease of deer, elk, and moose. It's called chronic wasting disease. Uh, it's been found all over the US and Canada, as well as South Korea. Uh, this is uh, one of these animals with this TSE reminiscent of the scrapie in sheep. So this is a fatal disease of uh, these animals. It can be found in both captive and free-ranging animals, and this is the uh, number of states or provinces with reported cases over the years. You can see we started picking it up in the 60s, and now we have uh, many states with incidents. In standing herds, uh, up to 90% of deer and 60% of elk can be positive. So many, many of these animals have this disease in the wild, 15%. So this is a TSE of deer, elk, uh, and moose. We're not sure how they spread it amongst each other, but um, these are some of the possibilities. The animals are shedding it, nasal secretions, saliva, skin, urine and feces, birthing matter, milk, blood from open wounds. So we think other animals can pick them up. You know, th if this animal contaminates a grazing area, another animal will eat the, the material and get infected as well. So people are trying to figure out how it's transmitted to stop this. Now, why are we so interested in this? Well. If you do the, the mouse experiment, you take cervid PRPSC, cervid are these deer, elk, and moose, you put it in a normal mouse, you don't get disease. You have to have the cervid PRNP gene in the mouse in order to get disease. So that would suggest that if humans ate a deer that was contaminated, it probably wouldn't acquire the disease if we think that mice are telling us what's going on. Uh, however, if you uh, so if you take cervid PRPSC and you can validate this, infect them into transgenic mice that have human PRNP, there's no disease. So you may think, well, this tells us that um, chronic wasting disease is not a threat for people, right? The problem is if you take the deer or cervid PRPSC and infect a cow, you get TSC, you get a disease. So the, the concern is that, you know, the deer are, are in the same areas as the cows. Deer certainly jump over the fences that surround cow herding areas and they can contaminate the pasture and the cows can acquire this infection. So we know that cows can be infected and then of course the cows can transmit it to people. So in addition to the spontaneous uh, TSE in cows, now we have the threat of this uh, deer chronic wasting disease transmission, and this is on the rise, so this could be more of an issue in coming years. So if you go to this site, uh, cwdinfo.org, this is a site for hunters, and you know people like to hunt deer, and they have instructions on how not to uh, take, it, take your shot deer. You know, you're not supposed to take any deer that looks sick, and you have to wear gloves, and don't really cut through the spinal cord, uh, don't consume these tissues as well. So uh, I don't, there's never been a case of human TSE associated 
with a contaminated deer. I think it probably won't happen that way. I think it will probably go through a cow. So this is a summary of all this prion uh, infection. And I, it's kind of interesting to look at that. And we've arranged it according to the naturally occurring disease and the artificially occurring disease. Okay, so the blue are what we think are natural occurrences of these prion diseases. So for example, uh, people getting sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob, probably people have already always developed this, and that gets transmitted when you, know, you donate organs or corneas and so forth, and you get iatrogenic Creutzfeldt-Jakob. Another naturally occurring disease is probably scrapie, and maybe uh, the chronic wasting disease uh, of deer, elk, and moose as well. And these can be transmitted probably to other animals. So probably the scrapie infection went to minks, which was detected in 1947. Uh, we think scrapie might have gone to cows and of course eventually to humans as well. And um, the cows may have spread it to other animals as well, uh, to other cattle, to various uh, cats, tigers, and primates because they're fed parts of cow. Uh, and to uh, house cats as well, which are, have been fed cow meat in the past. So probably all of these began with a sporadic occurrence in humans or in some other animal. And now what we're seeing is uh, spread in the population uh, by contact with that material as well as the continued sporadic and familial development. <laughs>